This evening, I will be presenting some preliminary results from a project I've been co-directing since 2005 on behalf of the British School with colleagues from the Kappa Gamma Ephoria of the Hellenic Archaeological Service, Dr. Andonis Vasilakis and Mrs. Maria Bredacci. The project was conceived to help generate a synthesis of what we have learned after a century of intensive research at Knossos. It was, Sorry, First off. it was considered essential that it be conducted as a collaboration between the British School and the Heraklion Ephoria, since the two institutions had shared responsibility for the archaeology of the Knossos Valley during that century. Knossos is situated six kilometers south of modern Heraklion, just inland from the central north coast of Crete. The site has received intense archaeological interest because it was one of the most important communities in the southern, Medi uh, southern Aegean. At various times, it dominated north central Crete, in some periods the entire island, and had very significant influence beyond Crete. For most of its urban history, it interacted with communities throughout the eastern and central Mediterranean. Today, it is visited by nearly a million people a year. To them, Trossos is the Bronze Age Palace, excavated and partially restored by Sir Arthur Evans. However, surrounding the palace, largely unrecognized, are one and a half square kilometers of ancient city. And beyond that, more than 10 square kilometers of its associated cemeteries. The initial investigations at the site were conducted by a local antiquarian, Minos Kalakerinos, who first recognized the Bronze Age Palace and dug various tests into it. As Cathy has noted, systematic investigations began in 1900, while Evans started clearing the Bronze Age Palace on a low hill near the center of the site. David Hogarth, then director of the British School, excavated some 300 pits around the valley searching for the prehistoric cemeteries. This provided the first archaeological overview of the site. Over the next 30 years, Evans finished excavating the palace and dug various grand Bronze Age mansions surrounding it, as well as several prehistoric cemeteries in the valley. His interest in the site focused very firmly on the prehistoric period. After Evans donated the palace and his estate to the British School, Researchers of the school, while continuing to excavate prehistoric remains, also broadened their investigations to encompass the entire history of the site. In addition to major research excavations, the school was regularly asked to undertake rescue excavations for the Ephoria, carried out by a succession of British school curators, fellows, and other researchers at Knossos. The rescue excavations were conducted by the Ephoria alongside those of the school, and since 1981, such excavations have been solely undertaken by the Ephoria. Together, over a century of continuous and intensive research by both institutions has made Knossos one of the most thoroughly investigated sites in the Eastern Mediterranean. This has produced a wealth of information documenting nearly eight millennia of occupation. Now this data allows us to outline the long-term development of the site, shown here on the right. But these maps make it clear how few data points most of these reconstructions are actually based on. In many cases, these dots simply represent a few sherds of a specific date found at, a, at, a, at an individual location. Such maps may encourage us to think we know a lot more than we actually do about the site and its development. It is clear that substantial areas of the site have never been investigated in any form, and our evidence drops off quite rapidly as one moves away from the palace and the center of the site. After a century of research, it seemed time to undertake a systematic and intensive survey of the entire site to put our understanding of its development on a more substantial and secure footing. The second focus of the project has been to document the surviving archaeological record of the valley to assist in its protection and management by the Ephoria in the face of the steady expansion of neighboring Heraklion. In the mid-1970s, the Alpha Zone was defined around the site to limit construction and protect the archaeological remains. The success of this protection can be seen here, where maps plot buildings in this expanding suburb of Heraklion at three points 
over the past 50 years. There is continuing pressure for development in the area, and accurate and detailed documentation of the archaeological resource is absolutely essential to inform the FREA's management strategies. So we define three objectives for the project. To record the archaeological resources, to aid their protection and help to manage future development in the valley. To document systematically the archaeological record, allowing us to contextualize and to reassess a century of previous research and rescue investigations in the valley. And three, to integrate the new systematic surface data with all existing data to reconstruct the long-term urban dynamics of the community at Knossos. Our work will also establish an up-to-date baseline for the development of continuing research at this exceptional site. We started our field work in 2005 on the city site and moved outwards in later years. Detailed study and documentation of all materials began last year and will continue for some years to come. But we have completed the initial sorting and cataloging of all recovered material, which enables us to present some preliminary results tonight. Over three six-week field seasons, we investigated all available fields in the study area on a 20-meter grid, providing dense and very high-resolution coverage. Collectors picked up all surface materials in a 10 square meter area to provide a tightly defined standard sample. They then examined the full square for features and collected any additional exceptional artifacts. Outside the city, to ensure that we would cover the entire study area, we searched rather faster transects, but again within those 20 meter grids. This enabled us to complete the field work as originally planned and on schedule. Overall, we collected some 355,000 sherds, some 49,000 fragments of tile, and another 20,000 or so non-ceramic artifacts in 21,000 squares spread over 11 square kilometers. And in this slide and many of the others, you'll see the entire survey area on the left, and then a detail of the city site itself on the right. After a presentation last year, we were slightly taken to task for not illustrating any pots. Believe me, I would love to be able to show you some pots, okay? I'd actually love to be able to show you two shirts that could be glued together. But frankly, we're dealing with surface material. However, we've been phenomenally fortunate in the material that we have recovered. Some 22% of our shirts preserve some trace of shape or decoration the kind of material that you see here. This is two to three times more than in most surface assemblages, and certainly in any of the surveys I've been involved with before. And because the pottery of Knossos has been so well documented, with well-preserved examples from excavations, now very fully documented in the, uh, the two Knossos handbooks, we can do an awful lot more with our material than most surveys. Nearly all of even the very plain body shirts can be assigned to at least broad periods. We also encountered plenty of features, such as walls, tombs, and stray architectural blocks. This slide gives an idea of the range of other finds. The vast bulk, not shown here, is relatively recent debris. Hardly exciting, but it provides a control sample for studying the processes of dispersion of finds into fields. Now, we're regularly asked, usually by archaeologists who primarily excavate, what collecting all this rubbish from the surface can actually tell us? Well, actually quite a lot. Even if with much lower spatial, temporal, and behavioral resolution than can be provided by in situ material from an excavation. And the reason for this can be seen in this plan and section from the unexplored mansion excavation at Knossos. Later occupants of the site often dug pits as bedding trenches for walls or to bury rubbish bringing earlier material to the surface. At Knossos, this is particularly severe as later occupants dug down to the Minoan levels to salvage dressed, dressed ashlar blocks for reuse. So we're constantly bringing new material all the way up. This accounts for the limited preservation of in situ deposits of early Iron Age to Hellenistic date in so many of the excavations at Knossos. Now, as a graphic example of the surface record, 
The image on the left of maps surface finds of Roman stone tesserae from mosaics. The bad news, of course, is that if these are on the surface, they represent mosaics which have been partially or completely destroyed. Largely, I believe, through the planting of the olives uh, across the site during the 1960s and 1970s. On the lower right, you see a damaged mosaic excavated in 1938, and you can see how close it was to the surface. So for most of the one and a half square kilometers of the ancient city, the prehistoric levels are about three to five meters down, largely inaccessible beneath later strata. The geometric to classical levels have been largely quarried away by late Hellenistic and Roman builders. And the Roman levels over much of the site have at least suffered a fair bit of recent, often severe damage. Bad days for the archaeology, perhaps, but it does mean that the site is particularly suitable for surface investigation, and the surface record should be able to inform us about the full history of occupation at the site. We are also regularly asked if, for such an intensively excavated site, there really is anything to learn from surface investigations. As you can see on the right, which plots counts of sherds of all dates, indicated in red, against the locations of excavations, in, indicated in black, we now have a much more extensive and continuous documentation of the archaeological record of the site and the wider valley. In fact, the picture provided by previous work is highly skewed toward the area around the palace, the focus for most research excavations, and the areas of the two villages, the hospital and the main road, where most of the rescue excavations have taken place. Looked at against what the survey now documents as the full distribution of material, the bulk of the site has had little or no investigation. And we can now also document a largely unknown halo of material representing suburbs, cemeteries, and other outlying activity areas. What sorts of things can we learn from surface evidence? I'll give two examples of how the surface work complements and indeed allows us to better understand the excavation record and then review our current understanding of the history of the site, integrating the previous research and our own. Taking the prehistoric occupation, on the left, left is a synthesis of the evidence for neopalatial occupation, which I compiled in 2000 on the basis of the excavated data, suggesting that the site extended over some 650 to 800 stramata. I was particularly cautious about the north and south extents of the site, where only a few sherds suggested any activity. On the right is our present understanding of the distribution of neopalatial sherds, with the outlaw limits that I'd inferred in 2000 superimposed. Now, I was clearly right to be cautious on the north, but far too conservative on the south, and frankly, we had no idea of the major extension of the site on the west, over the top, and down the far side of the Acropolis Hill. There simply had been no excavations there. We should now put the site extent in the neopalatial period at about one square kilometer. This is more than half again the original conservative estimate before our research began. But it isn't simply a matter of new data from places where we haven't looked before, though obviously there's plenty of that. Systematic and intensive coverage also contributes to understanding all the evidence from the site rather better. Here, against the distribution in orange of all Roman sherds, is plotted in blue the excavated Roman mosaics. These appear to define a particularly wealthy quarter along the main Roman northwest to southeast road through the center of the city. On the right, in red, are the loose mosaic tessera recovered by the survey, indicating, in contrast, the very extensive distribution of mosaics across the whole central third of the Roman city, an area almost entirely uninvestigated. So why is there such a discrepancy? First, the known mosaics document the bias of rescue excavations under the village and around the main road, which I've here highlighted in green. In contrast, this area is low in surface tessera because much of it is built over, so of course we couldn't survey it, or it's part of the original Evans estate, which has not been planted in olives, as has most of the rest of the city. 
tree planting seems to have disrupted the underlying Roman levels and therefore brought up the tessera to the surface. Furthermore, because the Evans estate land is not presently cultivated, but is heavily overgrown, recovery of very small artifacts by surface survey is likely to be very poor, or relatively poor. The effects of vegetation cover on tessera recovery can be seen on the lower right, where poor surface visibility is mapped in darker gray. So the previously known archeological record has been created through a variety of biasing factors. While our survey record also suffers from biases, there are different ones, and the systematic documentation of the survey can help us to understand these factors and therefore improve our understanding of the excavation record, not simply fill in the gaps in previous spatial coverage. So what are we learning about Knossos? This is an aggregate plot of the most diagnostic prehistoric pottery identified to date, showing, as most of the maps will, as I say, the entire survey area on the left and a detail of the city on the right. Other than the known Neolithic site at Katzambas, at the very top of the slide, the only significant amounts of Neolithic material occur immediately north of the palace, indicating that the site extended slightly into this area, which had not been previously investigated. But perhaps more significant than what we found is what we didn't find. The sherds we recovered, the Neolithic sherds, confirm that fragile, low-fire Neolithic pottery can, in, can indeed survive on the surface. Therefore, the absence of any concentrations of such material should indicate that occupation in the entire valley was highly nucleated uh, on the original hill under the later palace. This period also highlights the effective complementarity of excavation and survey evidence. Survey immediately around the palace was pointless because of Evans' spoil tips, and much of the area nearby is not accessible, being covered by the two villages and the car parks. The survey could only work on areas a little bit further out. Now, in conjunction with this work, we've also gone back through all of the retained material from the excavations around the fringe of the palace and do the rescue excavations further out to try and ensure that we can uh, pick up the material that's contemporary with what we've been finding and ensure the effective integration of both the existing and our new data with their complementary spatial coverages. Negative evidence is also relevant to excavations and the green dots which I plotted here indicate excavation soundings to natural soil which did not encounter deposits of Neolithic material, tightly defining the maximum extent of the Neolithic community along the ridge to the west of the palace. For the early pre-palatial Bronze Age, early Minoan 1 and 2, we face the same constraints on coverage. In other words, we can't get close to the palace itself. But again, the absence of shared concentrations of these dates away from the palace confirms, again, extreme nucleation of occupation on the palace site. Both positive and negative evidence indicate only a little extension of occupation beyond the Neolithic community westwards to the modern road. Extending over some 65 stramata and probably densely occupied, the population of the site may have exceeded 2,000 people by the later third millennium, making it one of the largest communities in the early Bronze Age, Aegean. Early Minoan III to Middle Minoan I-A sees a rapid buildup to the emergence of the Minoan palatial states. At Knossos, this saw the construction from worked, probably quarried blocks of the massive northwest terrace underlying the later palace, shown here as the inset at the top of the slide. Rescue excavations under the villages and modern road usually reveal ceramics of this date as the earliest material on natural soil, documenting dense, continuous occupation and a very rapid expansion of the community during this relatively short late prepalatial phase. The excavated deposits indicate occupation over some 200 stramata, but a few distant outlying excavations Evans's north quarter of the city and soundings under the Roman Villa Dionysus raised the possibility that the settlement may have expanded to as much as 400 stramata during this short phase. 
The surface finds provide some support for this larger community, including the expansion of occupation to the slope of the Gypsades Hill, immediately south of the palace, where only small quantities of contemporary shirts have been recovered from previous excavations. Considerably more material can be ascribed to the Middle Minoan periods, including protopalatial, and I'm also including here the earlier neopalatial, Middle Minoan III material, documenting continued dramatic effectively exponential population ex expansion. This, of course, was the period in which Cretan polities established sustained contact with the Bronze Age states of the Eastern Mediterranean. While out on the fringe of the then known world, Knossos was as large and significant a center as most of the Levantine cities it was interacting with. Expansion continued into the neopalatial period when occupation probably covered about a square kilometer, nearly doubling estimates of the extent of the site based on the excavated evidence alone. Judging by residential densities, this should represent a population probably approaching 25,000 inhabitants. And this is urbanism on a scale comparable to all but the largest imperial capitals of the Bronze Age East Mediterranean. For the neopalatial period, the character of the houses excavated at various points moving out from the palace gives some idea of the internal organization at the core of the city. This excavated evidence obviously provides a subtlety of understanding that surface evidence alone can rarely provide. So again, an argument for using the two together. On the summit of the hill of Elias to the east, we can now better define two distinct small suburbs recognized in the 1970s highlighted on the left in blue. Further out, indicated in green on the right, we seem to be picking up two distinct small sites. Based on limited tomb evidence, an analogy with the distribution of the better preserved late Minoan two to three tombs, the city was ringed on the east, south, west, and probably also the north by cemeteries. These clusters of tombs are well characterized by published examples. Now, we didn't actually expect to recover much evidence for cemeteries on the surface, since the standard rock-cut tombs protect their contents from exposure very effectively. But the material covered can now suggest various outlying cemeteries, defined by low density, by distinct low-density scatters of late Minoan material. Recogn recognition of these is likely to be patchy, since areas with excavated tombs can sometimes show very little on the, on the uh, surface indications. But numerous areas never previously investigated seem likely to represent a whole uh, a number of smaller cemeteries around the site. For the later Bronze Age, we have not so far attempted to subdivide our limited number of diagnostic sherds. This period, of course, spans the collapse of palatial Minoan society with the destruction and only partial reoccupation of the Bronze Age palace. Settlement evidence documenting how demography related to changing political status would be a welcome new source of information on this highly debated transformation. Here, the blue circles indicate estimates of site size based on the limited available excavated evidence, which suggests a dramatic decline. But I'd be a little cautious about this because for all other periods where we can pick and compare the excavated evidence to our surface evidence, usually the, the, surface, the, sorry, the excavated evidence significantly underestimates the actual site extent. So the city in each phase could well be rather larger. Now, as with all the other phases, through re-examining dated excavated deposits, we are trying to define a wider range of diagnostics that we can rely on for dating our material, rather than just the highly decorated fine wares largely studied to date. But realistically speaking, we have so few examples of those most highly diagnostic fine painted wares that even with expert assessment, the samples will probably be too small for a very confident phase by phase mapping of the extent of occupation through this dramatic collapse episode. Viewed over the long term, we can now document very rapid urbanization in the late pre-palatial period with continuing dramatic expansion through the proto-palatial 
and neopalatial periods. This provides a dynamic and novel perspective on both the origin and continuing development of Minoan center and state. In addition, Knossos in the late neopalatial period was twice the size of any of the other palatial centers, providing perhaps new support for the argument that it politically dominated at least central Crete. We can base such political inferences, at least partially, on our survey evidence by considering the territory which would have been required simply to feed the population, which we can now estimate for the city in different phases. This, of course, only gives a minimum definition of its dependent territory, but provides a new basis for thinking about and constructing political inferences for the island. The Hellenic phase, running from sub-Minoan to Hellenistic, covers roughly a millennium, comparable to the Palatial Bronze Age. We have not yet, in our initial assessments, attempted to subdivide this abundant material much, except based on very distinctive shapes, decoration, and one exclusive fabric type, we have identified significant quantities of protogeometric through orientalizing sherds, which I've plotted here. This does allow us to pretty decisively support one of the two models for early polis development at Knossos, also potentially relevant to other sites on Crete and beyond. Noting the widespread of discrete cemeteries, indicated on the left in blue, at some distance from the core of the earlier and the later city, Alexiou proposed that Knossos conformed to Aristotle's model of polis formation as an amalgamation from originally dispersed villages. Coldstream argued against this that there was a nucleated core community which had survived into the Iron Age from the Bronze Age. The surface evidence for the site, indicated on the right, dramatically adds to the very limited and poorly preserved excavated settlement evidence, indicating a site expanding to about half a square kilometer by the early archaic period. Contextualizing this, there is no evidence to suggest small hamlets adjacent to the known dispersed early Iron Age cemeteries, those in blue on the left. The data we now have documenting a very substantial community during the early Iron Age at Knossos is also more consistent with the evidence provided by the tomb offerings from those excavated cemeteries, which indicated a wealthy and interregionally extremely well-connected community. Despite the dearth of well-preserved excavated deposits, further work with the surface ceramics should allow us to track the development of the city continuously through this millennium, as Knossos expanded its regional political status through conquest and alliances. This is particularly important since Crete preserves a relatively scanty historical record for this dynamic period. One interim conclusion, however, is that Knossos probably reached its maximum size well over a square kilometer during the Hellenistic period, paralleling its documented political and territorial expansion. Early in the first century BC, Crete was conquered by the Romans and Knossos refounded as a colony with the settling of an unknown number of colonists. The loss of independent political status appears to be reflected in a marked reduction in size from the presumed Hellenistic maximum. Unlike Roman Gorton, which, isolated in the southern Mesera, preserved a remarkable set of ruins seen at the top in Tournefort's early engraving, Knossos appears to have been used as a convenient stone quarry for Byzantine, Venetian, and Ottoman Heraclean. However, a few monuments survived, at least until the early 20th century, including fragments of a theater and a massive civic basilica assumed to define one side of the Roman Forum. Originally and imaginatively planned by a Venetian monk, Honorio Belli, in the late 16th century, it was still largely visible in the early 20th century and can be seen in this remarkable photograph from the early 1890s, about two decades after its stone facings were said to have been removed for the construction of an Ottoman barracks in Heraklion. Some of its pillars and collapsed vaults still survive, shown on the lower left, built into the ruins of an abandoned nightclub and give tantalizing hints 
at the monumental public architecture of Roman Knossos. Indications of prosperity are also provided by the private architecture, including the exceptionally grand Villa Dionysus with its finely crafted mosaics. The survey is one fragment of mosaic, seen here at the upper right, and our bags of loose tesserae, are difficult to get too excited about and obviously cannot convey the standard of crafting of the mosaics from the Villa Dionysus or inform us about the mythological illusions, illusions of the wealthy uh, Colossians. But they can help to contextualize these excavated examples. The Roman mosaic tesserae I mentioned earlier as a sad indication of the scale of destruction of the uppermost archeological levels across the site provide a vivid example of the complementarity of excavation and survey evidence. On the right in red are the loose mosaic tesserae recovered by the survey, indicating the extensive distribution of mosaics across the entire third uh, of the Roman city. The rampant consumerism and diverse material culture of the Roman phase holds out the most promise for developing an understanding of the nature and organization of the city contrasting different types of material distributions. And I've indicated some of our most abundant, the categories of most abundant material here. Perhaps surprisingly, given the intense archeological exploration of Roman cities throughout the empire, this is actually one of relatively few that has been completely and intensively surveyed, providing new opportunities to study the structure and organization of a major Roman city. This is also the period for which we have the richest evidence for the wider landscape context of the city. Stretches of the Roman aqueduct were traced in the 1970s, and we have added more at the northern and southern ends of the valley, including the bridge support for the crossing of the Keratos alongside the Ottoman aqueduct. The Ottoman aqueduct, shown upper right for scale, has a closed siphon system carrying water down and then up the other side to reduce its construction height. While we know the Romans employed this principle elsewhere, if they didn't do so here, the bridge supporting the aqueduct would have needed at least another row of arches adding to its height. The limestone slopes defining the valley are dotted with quarries, undated, but we follow Hood and Smythe, Contra Evans, in anticipating that most were Roman rather than Minoan. These include many small exposures but also a 40 stramata open quarry on the summit of the hill of Elias, and several large gallery quarries at Spilia and Ayurini at the south end of the valley. Ringing the site, as in earlier periods, are extensive cemeteries, with most rock exposures in the south and the southwest of the valley riddled with rock cut chamber tombs. A broad range of tomb types, including simple tile and pit graves, but also built kists, vaulted tombs, and elaborate mausolea document a diverse and socially complex mortuary landscape. The ostentatious built mausolea appear to cluster along the high visibility north and south routes out of the valley. And the survey has located numerous additional rock cut tombs. The end of the city's life is poorly documented archeologically. A particular problem for the past 30 years has been reconciling the lack of excavated occupation deposits with the massive 5th to 7th century mortuary basilica on the site of the late Bronze Age through Bowman North Cemetery, plan at the center top there. The nearby sanatorium basilica, as well as traces of Roman masonry at the surviving village church of Ios Sophia and ruins of the Byzantine chapel at Ios Kyrilos, round out a picture of continuing religious life and death, but no corresponding community was clearly documented. A few deposits and some stray material of fifth to sixth century date have been excavated, but the evidence is extremely patchy. We can now fill this gap by recognizing later Roman to late antique surface material concentrated in the northwest quarter of the Roman city. This has probably been missed previously because of the focus of excavations to the south the fairly ephemeral nature of many late antique constructions and the destruction of the uppermost deposits in the plough soil. It is likely that the lower village, Makritikos, 
survived as a hamlet through the post-Roman period around its late Roman church. But there is no evidence for the survival of Knossos on an urban scale beyond the latest burials dated to about 700 AD. Coastal Heraklion, established west of the earlier Minoan port at Poros Katambas, had been a port community from at least the Hellenistic period and probably developed continuously through the Roman and early Byzantine and later the Saracen, late Byzantine, Venetian and Ottoman periods. It seems likely that most of the population of Knossos gradually relocated there during the later Roman and early Byzantine periods. For the long post-Roman period, the survey record essentially represents the low density off-site scatter of material seemingly introduced to the agricultural fields through fertilizing with domestic refuse. Throughout this period, in addition to serving the small populations of the villages of Makritikos and Fortezza, the valley was part of the agricultural hinterland for Candia. Now what I presented to you this evening is a brief tour of our preliminary assessments. We've completed our initial look at all recovered materials, but specialist studies, as I noted, have only just begun. But we hope this, we hope this gives you a flavor of what the project is trying to do and what it has accomplished to date. It should be obvious how much it builds on the previous century of research by both the British School and the Ephoria. But it is also aiming to do something new, to provide a more comprehensive framework within which past research can be more fully contextualized and interpreted, working at the scale of the city as a whole, not just focusing on an individual excavation. Attention to the full occupation sequence is particularly important because historical records for Crete are generally more limited than for many other areas of the Aegean. Equally, archaeological research on the island has, not surprisingly, particularly focused on the distinctive prehistoric record. Taking comparable approaches to the entire archaeological record at Knossos also encourages diachronic comparisons and consideration of long-term development. It's striking, for example, that the process of urbanization and state development follow a broadly comparable pattern and time scale for the Bronze Age palace-centered polity and the Iron Age oligarchic city-state. Different sources contribute to our understanding of this sequence and processes in each millennium, so comparative approaches are likely to be mutually informative. Where does the project go from here? As noted, we have an awful lot of studies still to do on our material, on the study of the diagnostic materials, and we'll this will continue for some time to come, and it will allow us to add detail to the outlines presented here tonight. We're also working with the extensive retained material from past excavations to improve our ability to extract useful information from the less diagnostic plain body sherds, which constitute nearly 80% of our collections. This material is usually simply discarded on Mediterranean surveys if it's even collected in the first place. But with such an intensively studied and well-documented ceramic sequence, we can do considerably more with the, with the battered body sherds, even simply on the basis of fabric than most other projects have attempted. This is a major benefit from long-term intensive engagement at the site. Here, the plain body sherds, which can be identified as prehistoric, mapped in blue, can be seen to corroborate the more ephemeral distributions of the smaller sample of diagnostics, which can be more precisely identified, indicated in red. Increasing sample sizes at each individual collection point will allow us much greater confidence in the spatial patterns we can detect. I've mentioned already the importance of documenting recent land use to understand the formation and transformations of the surface archaeological record. Away from the fairly level core of the city, we will also need to understand localized geomorphological change to determine which surface materials are in situ, which are derived from upslope, and which parts of the landscape have been to some degree or other masked by downslope erosion. While not yet employed extensively at Knossos, limited geophysical investigations have indicated that these techniques can be applied very productively 
as this early 1990s survey near the Villa Dionysus indicates. Because intensive occupation shifted northward through time, specific areas should be particularly amenable to revealing period-specific details of urban planning and occupation density, as well as any exceptional structures. Ground penetrating radar has developed rapidly in recent years, and tests suggest it may be able to map down to the Minoan levels, even in the deeply stratified core of the city, which would otherwise be essentially inaccessible. Many visible ancient features have been noted over the past century, and many more have been identified by our project. For example, here in the north of the city, a large concentration of blue and green glass mosaic tessera, extending over an area of about 80 by 60 meters, was found around extensive remains of a major Roman construction, which will certainly repay further investigation. Less dramatically, the survey has documented many exposed walls, probable tombs and quarries, which need to be examined in detail, and many may, re may deserve full documentation. With the broad contextual information recovered by the survey, considerably more sense can be made of the abundant small rescue excavations undertaken throughout the past century, and these are a further area for ongoing collaboration between the British School and the Ephoria for their study and documentation. With these follow-up investigations, designed to help us understand better the existing excavation and surface evidence, as well as the full study, documentation, and analysis of the material we've collected, we're going to be busy for some time to come. While our preliminary, or pr sorry, primary obligation is studying and publishing our own field work, the project aimed from the start at broader goals, to document and thereby help protect the archeological resources to synthesize existing research and encourage more integrated study of previously collected data, and to provide a baseline for developing new research at the site. What was obvious in preparing for this project, and we draw upon constantly as we try to make sense of our new material, are the tremendous resources available for the study of this exceptional site. These are very directly the result of such a long, intensive, and productive research engagement at the site by the British School at Athens and the Kappa Gamma Ephoria. Through the exceptional nature of the site, this research also provides a cross-section of most of the history of human occupation on Crete, and indeed, much of the wider southern Achaean, as well as bringing together the varied evidence for the long history of the site and its changing character and importance in different periods, the Kossos Urban Landscape Project will lay a, foundation, a solid foundation for the next century of productive collaboration between the British School and the Archaeological Service at Knossos. We'd like to thank both of our host institutions and the Institute of Archaeology, University College London, for supporting the project, and the Ministry of Culture for granting the permit for the fieldwork. We would also particularly like to thank the residents of the Knossos Valley, who almost universally allowed us to survey their properties, and the many volunteers who did so and have subsequently helped us work on the material. Thank you.